Greetings, I'm Scott Olson of Ocala, Florida. My talk is Plato's Golden Numbering System, Biometric Anomalies, Abduction, and the Ontological Roots of Consciousness. Upon thoughtful consideration of a staggering body of anomalous evidence, it appears that a profound golden mean number system may underlie the cosmos, nature, and consciousness. There is the pervasive and puzzling presence of the golden ratio throughout physics, chemistry, biology, and cosmology, often veiled in Fibonacci and Lucas numbers. This ontological superstructure was known to Plato and the Pythagoreans as the one and indefinite dyad. Our concern here will be an examination of some of these anomalies and an ab abductive inference to the best explanation to account for them, namely the golden mean number system, which we contend is the enfolded substructure of all existence, including consciousness. David Bohm, one of my professors at Birkbeck, maintain that the essential features of quantum interconnectedness are that the whole universe in some way is enfolded in everything and that each thing is enfolded in the whole. Bohm's Hola movement, in which the universe enfolds in everything, begins with what the ancient Egyptians referred to as the primordial scission, the first cut, the golden section. The one asymmetrically divides into two parts in which all are bound together by continuous geometric proportion. So in the golden cut, the larger segment becomes what we call phi, or 1 over phi, namely 0 0.6180339 onto infinity. And the smaller segment is phi squared, or 1 over phi squared, 0 0.3819, etc., to infinity. However, when you ask, what is the ratio of the whole line to the segments, we find that the whole line is phi, 1.6180339, and the longer segment is 1, and the shorter segment is phi. 0 0.6180339, so we get phi, 1, and phi. Plato in the Republic says, take a line and cut it unevenly. The cutting of a line unevenly in a certain way, the only way, is the golden cut to give continuous geometric proportion, where we have the longer, the whole is phi, the longer segment is 1, so phi is to 1 is as 1 is to phi. And there, therefore, we get our one and what we call the indefinite dyad, the greater and the lesser. So that one, then, is the geometric mean between the greater and the lesser, phi and phi, and it is also the, the difference between the two, and it is the product of the two. Phi is also the simplest continued fraction. Uh, it's equal to 1 plus 1 over 1 plus 1 over 1 plus 1 over 1 onto infinity. And it is the simplest nested radical, square root of 1 plus square root of 1 plus square root of 1, etc. Notice the significance of the use of 1 in this formula. Biology. So the golden key is the one and indefinite dyad that we see here up at the top, or super implicate order along the lines of David Bohm, which is enfolded into the implicate order of the golden mean number system and is then unfolded through the explicate order expression of the Fibonacci numbers and the Lucas numbers. Fibonacci ratios asymptotically approach phi in the limit. So you see they'll go above and below any time we take a ratio of two of the, the uh, Fibonacci numbers, for example, 5 divided by 3, 1.666, 8 divided by 5 is 1.6, and they merge into the golden ratio in the limit. Fibonacci numbers also are composed of the greater and the lesser, phi and phi, and their powers by add, addition and subtraction. We find the Fibonacci numbers in the pine cone, sunflower, pineapple, and Romanesco. Notice here that in the pineapple we have 13 whorls, 8 whorls, and 5 whorls, very much like the microtubules we'll see eventually. Here we have a pine cone with 13 whorls in one direction, 8 in the other direction. Sometimes you'll find 8 is to 5, 5 is to 3, 3 is to 2. Phylotaxis is leaf arrangement, and Barbie and Jean and symmetry in plants find that the presence of particular numbers, Fibonacci numbers, an angle of 137 and a half degrees, which we'll talk about shortly, and the golden number, or big phi, uh, demand an explanation, and it is in phylotaxis that symmetry in plants is most striking and puzzling. There are 250,000 species of higher plants, roughly, but only three types of leaf arrangement, distichous, whorled, and spiral. In the spiral, you get the maximum moisture, sunlight, and pollination. 
underlying the diversity is an unexpected and startling degree of order, according to Brian Goodwin, and, and how the leopard changes its spots. Over 80% of these 250,000 species of plants have spiral phyllotaxis. The rotation angle is limited to only a few values. The most common one is 137 and a half degrees, which results from a golden cutting of a 360 degree line where you have 222 and a half degrees and 137 and a half degrees. Here, I am <clears throat> measuring the uh, medial phalange, and what, what we notice in the hand is a golden proportional arrangement of the phalanges. Locus ratios also asymptotically approach phi when we take ratios just like we did with the Fibonacci numbers, and they meet the golden ratio in the limit. Here we have 2, 1, 3, 4, 7, 11, 18 for the Lucas numbers. More fascinating of all, most fascinating, is that Lucas numbers are pure combinations, additions and subtractions of the sequence of golden powers of the greater and of the lesser. For example, greater squared plus lesser squared is exactly three. Greater cubed minus lesser cubed, exactly four. So let's take a look at this. God created the integers, all else is the work of man, according to Leopold Kronecker, the 19th century mathematician. Well, whether it's the source or God, here's what is happening. We have phi to the fourth and phi to the fourth, and they add together. Notice how they will sum together, and notice the nines that pop up, and they will continue on and on ad infinitum, giving us the exact number seven. The biometric measurements of the human skull are adjacent uh, Lucas numbers. Now, the bregma cuts the nasioiniac arc, which is here, at the golden section. And that arc, relative to the bregma inion arc, is as 18 is to 11, or 1.63. The bregma inion arc, relative to the nason bregma arc, is 11 is to 7, or 1.57. Tamargo and Pendrick observed in their limited sampling of mammalian skulls a progression toward the golden ratio in the partition of the nasionic arc by Bregma. So here we see humans, and here we see the big cats, and that becomes extremely interesting. The biometric measurements of the lion and tiger skulls are ratios of adjacent Lucas numbers. So again, the nasionic arc relative to the <clears throat> uh, Bregma is Isian arc is 7 is to 4, 1.75. Whereas the Bregma Isian arc relative to the Nason Bregma arc is 4 is to 3, or 1.33. This should be of interest to those on a shamanic path where identification with the big cat is not uncommon. I, in fact, had a major experience in the Amazon rainforest with ayahuasca, and within a year I'd written the golden section. Later I wrote Mysteries of the Amazon, a catalog for my gallery exhibit, Visionary Artwork of Pablo Amaringo and his Students. Also, some of our participants, um, now deceased, of course, Ralph Metzner, Bruce Damer, and Luis Eduardo Luna also contributed articles to it. We also find that there's a pervasive presence of Fibonacci numbers and the golden ratio throughout biology. Jean-Claude Perez discovered that in codon populations and single-stranded whole human genome DNA, we have fractal and fine, or they're fine-tuned by the golden ratio and they're related to Fibonacci and Lucas numbers. He also found two binary code attractors. The, the lesser, little baby phi, and one half the lesser. These two states create a self-organizing bistable binary code that are in perfect octave of one another. The genomes of both Homo sapiens and Neanderthals exhibit Fibonacci and Lucas residences. In 2009, Perez found the widespread occurrence of phi in the Fibonacci series throughout 20 various species. The codon populations of these various species include simple cells and viruses and show that the three parameters define the populations to a precision of 99% and often 99.999%. And those three parameters are one, two, and the greater or phi. Notice 
Uh, with the HIV virus, we have an icosahedron whose internal structure is guided by golden rectangles of ratios of phi to one. Petikoff confirmed Perez's supercode of DNA and then went on to discover a law of golden genome matrices underlying the genetic code, which is based upon only two values, the greater big phi and the lesser little baby phi. Blood pressure follows the golden ratio. The greater golden ratio is present in the human heartbeat's cardiac cycle, and ideal human biomechanics and gait are governed by the golden ratio, consciousness. The big anomaly was Sir Roger Penrose's question, why do Fibonacci numbers appear in microtubules, which he wrote in Shadows of the Mind. Of course, we have 13, eight is to five. In 2019, Hemerov indicated that EEG waves now appear to be the result of microtubule oscillations, including gamma synchrony, the best neural correlate of consciousness. In 2019, Hamroff indicated that anesthetics dampen and psychedelics, or entheogens, promote quantum vibrations in microtubules. Tangled or mutated tau protein molecules result in microtubule disintegration leading to dementia, Alzheimer's disease, and even cancer. Normally, they will stabilize and assist the microtubules. Tuzinski indicated that mitochondria are photon entities and microtubules may be receivers. Clathrins are truncated icosahedra with golden geometric resonance, and they're associated with microtubules, and they're involved in synaptic transmitter release. Rupin discovered that the neocortex appears to have found a way to pack as many minimally interfering frequency bands by using phi as a common ratio between adjacent frequencies in the EEG spectrum. Sir Harold Crotto won the Nobel Prize in 1999 for chemistry with his team, having discovered the structure of carbon-60 to be a truncated icosahedron. And again, as you notice, here that we have the internal structures, three, three phi by one rectangles, golden rectangles, physics. The chaos border finds structure constant, quark masses, all are functions of the golden ratio. In fact, the CAM theorem, <clears throat> Um, asserts that the most stable periodic orbit is that which has an irrational ratio of resonance frequencies, and since the golden mean is the most irrational number, the corresponding orbit is the most stable orbit thus aligned one to observe a particle. The inverse fine structure coupling constant is 20 phi to the fourth power, and in fact in 2010 the golden ratio was discovered in the phase transitions of quantum mechanics. All quarks are functions of the golden ratios. Notice uh, El Nashi's calculations here using the golden ratio, big phi, in these uh, uh, calculations for the quarks. Check out some of our view YouTube videos. Hardy discovered that probability of entanglement, and therefore non-locality of two particles, is exactly equal to little baby phi to the fifth power roughly 9%, but because he rounded it off, others did not realize what he had got. But this is absolutely amazing. El Nashi found it to be remarkably exactly twice as large as the ordinary energy density of the universe, or V to the fifth divided by two, roughly 4.5%. He also found that the energy of dark matter is four times V to the sixth, and pure dark energy is five times V to the fourth respectively 22% and roughly 73%, totaling about 95.5% of the energy of the universe. In the double slit experiment, the golden mean number system underlies the collapse of the pre-quantum wave into the pre-quantum particle, whether we're talking Copenhagen theory, whether we're talking ORC, uh, objective uh, uh, reduction, <clears throat> or a combination of both, which some of us are now thinking. Golden Fibonacci anions provide the simplest model for universal quantum computation by particle exchange or braiding alone. According to the physicist Herman Otto, Fibonacci anions as qubits may be the ultimate approach to quantum computation because they naturally simulate processes which determine the speed and storage capacity of the human brain, cosmos. John Martineau, noted that if you draw a line between Venus and Earth every day with the sun in the center, you get a five-pointed rosette after eight years. 
but that's 13 years on Venus. 13 is to 8 is as 8 is to 5 as we see here in the Fibonacci numbers. As above, so below. So what's happening in the solar system also is happening down below with the plants. The relative moon orbits and mean diameters of Earth and Mercury approximate phi squared s to 1. The orbits of Neptune and Pluto are in 3 as to 2 Fibonacci resonance a musical fifth. The TRAPPIST-1 solar system has six planets which have orbital frequencies of 8, 5, 3, 2, musical fourth and one. But notice that the musical fourth is also composed of Lucas numbers, the four and the three. Four of these planets are Earth size and have the possibility of liquid water. The adjacent orbits of all six planets of Kepler 11 are virtually in three is to two Fibonacci resonance, the musical fifth. All the planets are locked in rhythmic harmony like a waltz in a cosmic ballroom. The recent reassessment of the Planck satellite data now makes it more probable that the universe is spherical-like rather than flat. The anomalies of the second and third harmonics of the cosmic background radiation being weaker than expected abductively suggest exactly what Plato had said, that the universe is dodecahedral. Conclusion. Taken together, this family of anomalous facts abductively lead towards an inevitable inference to the best explanation of a golden superstructure of the one and indefinite dyad, providing a proportional golden mean number system that is enfolded and fused into the implicate order of nature and the cosmos as its very structure, substructure. Life and consciousness namely panpsychism, and I would say cosmopsychism, pour in from the very beginning in the Holo movement, writing these golden numbers from the superstructure that appears with the initial ontological act. Big cut, big bang, big bounce. This points to a grand unification of the sciences, arts, and consciousness through a golden mean number system. As Bohm would suggest, each part has the entire universe enfolded into it with all the infinite potential and possibility implicit within that can be unfolded along the way through the explicate order of the Fibonacci and Lucas numbers. References. I'll show these briefly for you. Keep showing me the room. And they'll be, of course, in the film that you can look at later. There's three pages of them. And then finally, my email address is olsons at cf.edu. My website is goldensection.expert and also mysteriesoftheamazon.com. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My presentation is to talk about free will. The title is, There is no free will, only will to freedom. I gave it a poetic title to express my view that we should adopt a humble attitude and integrate ourselves into the natural world. Before the presentation, I would like to talk about myself a little bit. I'm from Taiwan. I was in the business world for a long time. I was a management consultant. I was an entrepreneur of a software company in mainland China. After I sold my share, I'm now a botanical artist running an art association. I'm also a philosophy enthusiast, especially in philosophy of mind and the consciousness studies. I'm now developing my thesis about existence cosmopsychism. In this presentation, I will do the comparison for the definition of freedom in different free will theories. I will look for possibilities of freedom from modern science and the radical consciousness theories. I will conclude that, well, it's more essential than action. Here is a little bit about abstract. 
this presentation contains with the argument of denying existence of the free will defined by the philosophical indeterminist and the compatibilist by questioning the definition of freedom and the role of agent. There are also objections to the libertarian arguments according to the limitation of alternative possibilities and the will setting action. I'm going to conduct reviewing and analyzing the determinations, premises, and the scenario of notion of freedom. It is predictable that the goal of the definition and the proposition of freedom leads to the different views. It might be the right timing to rethink whether to release the current concept of freedom and reshape a new or even deeper sense of freedom. The presentation also contains views from neuroscience and biology, including Benjamin Libet, J.D. Hans, and Stuart Hemroff. I conclude that freedom is not inherent in nature and our mind is grounded by outside fundamental ultimate. This is the will of the mind to change destiny that loosen the decision and the actions that have emerged from the conscious unconsciousness for thousand times and the change the way of looking at and the responding to the world, which is the freedom we can will for. In the beginning, I would like to do the comparison of the freedom in different views. For indeterminists, the core idea is that there are alternative possibilities before us, and we reason and deliberate among them and choose. Their definition of freedom is about up to us. First, we could have chosen or action otherwise. Second, the ultimate source of our action lies in us and not outside us, in factor beyond our control. This is what they so-called deeper freedom. For determinism, the idea is that an event is determined when there are conditions obtaining earlier whose occurrence is a sufficient condition for the occurrence of the event. There is only one possible path into the future, which means same path to the same future. For compatibilism, the idea is there is no conflict between determinism and the free will. They are compatible. Under compatibilism, there is classical compatibilism. The idea is determinism is compatible with free will, even it, if it should turn out that what they will or desire was determined by the past. There are two definitions of their freedom. One, a power or ability to do what they want or desire to do. Two, there is no constraints or imp impediments preventing me from making choice or choosing otherwise. But they are criticized by saying that it seems to capture the surface freedom. They admit they, that only freedom of action without freedom of will. But we are not satisfied with it. So there is new compatibilism. The views leverage hierarchical motivation theory by claiming that we always have second order volition or reflective self evaluation, evaluation system, and that is exactly the function of agent. Their freedom includes that first, wholeheartedness means fully satisfied without doubt. They also focus on value over desire. Third, they also focus on reasoning over desire, means they can harmonize the soul in self-control or, or self-discipline. They are also face, face criticism uh, by saying it leads to a result of infinite number of higher order reflection 
and the, the reflective self-evaluation alone is not sufficient for free will. For incompatibilism, the simple idea is that it is the view that free will and the determinism are in conflict. Their freedom is talking about two conditions. One, ultimate responsibility, which focus on the source or grounds or origins of what we actually do, rather than on the power to do otherwise. This is their so-called freedom of will instead of freedom of action. Under incompatibilism, there is hard determinism. It is the view that first, free will is incompatible with determinism. This is against the compatibilist. And second, free will does not exist. This is against libertarians. Their freedom, there are two uh, meanings. First, a feeling of existence of an agent makes us mistakenly believe that we have freedom. Second, what we want is greater autonomy, which is freedom of will. Second, there is an incompatibilism called libertarianism. Libertarianism. The view is that first, free will and the determinism are incompatible. Second, free will exists. And the third, determinism is false. The deeper freedom is what they talk about. First, act of will cannot by nature be determined by prior event. Second, Free choices do not merely occur in irrational way. Third, ultimate responsibility is something required by free will. First, they are undetermined will setting action or self forming action. After the review, we got some findings. We got some findings from the comparison. First, the freedom is compromised by compatibilists. For classical compatibilists, they accept that freedom is limited to freedom of action. For new compatibilists, they are criticized that self-reflective psychology status is not sufficient for free will. Second, both extreme incompatibilists surprisingly agree with deeper sense of freedom. For libertarian, they hold the notion of agent, so there is free will existing. For hard determinist, they give up the notion of agent, so free will is an illusion. Third, the version of free will worthy for our further discussion is that people have the ability to perceive all the factors of decisions, thoughts, and actions, and to control them completely. This is a so-called deeper freedom or ultimate responsibility. So, they are objections to the compatibilist and the indeterminist freedom. First, classical compatibilist freedom of action has been abandoned by incompatibilist. However, the deeper sense of freedom is not available from brain or consciousness research or even philosophical inference. Second, for the new compatibilist who still cling to the concept of agency. Hard determinists deny that there is a higher order of desire, motive, or idea that determines thought or actions. Third, 
no matter how many functional states are given to the agent, we just cannot find sufficient reason to explain the occurrence of the thought or action. It is believed that the role of agent is neither helpful nor responsible for removing the confusion of freedom. Fourth, free will has been denied that the indeterminist talks about from the perspective of quantum jumping. Hard determinists argue that the inference of this uncaused, random, and autonomously formed potential change on the state of the brain has nothing to do with neither freedom or will. There are also objections to libertarian freedom. Libertarian believe that alternative possibilities and the ultimate responsibility are sufficient and the necessary conditions for free will. For, all, for alternative possibilities, it presents not being determined and conformed to the definition of up to me. For an agent, is placed for ultimate responsibility and well-setting actions to deal with open possibilities and produced self-forming actions. This is the belief of libertarians. They got some objections. First, true freedom, regardless of whether there is the, exactly the same path or not, one should have different future options to choose from in the present. That is to say, the past has no meaning for libertarians in the strict sense. Libertarianism does not follow the original intent of garden forking path. Second, libertarianism lacks in-depth explanations of the cause of action. The discussion of the free will should cover both external stimuli and self-induced behavior to achieve a significant influence or implication. However, the philosophical argument of the libertarianism is overly focused on external stimulus actions. This is relatively loosened when comparison with the design of self paths for scientific experiments. So we can see the original version as a new version of garden forking paths uh, in the slides. Let's continue. Libertarians they further argue that self-forming action under indeterminism comes from the situation of self-induced action, including conflicting or difficult decision-making tasks. This situation has inherent tension and uncertainty, and it requires agents to work hard to overcome inertial tendencies and form friction in the heart through the feeling of the moment of searching for their soul. Legal objections. First, this is a good supporting for new version of garden forking path. Second, torn decisions are still a type of a case for external stimulus actions. In any case of choosing one of the two in the dilemma, it is hard to see whether freedom is. Third, in our lives, there are a lot of vague and extremely poor degree of readiness decision-making situations and more complicated and unclear selection processes, which cannot produce the tension effort frictions and or other elements required by libertarians' self-forming action. Therefore, self-forming action argument does not apply to practical decision-making patterns. Let's look at the scientific 
experiment to see if any crew for us to find out the freedom. First, Benjamin Libet's famous experiment, experiments in 1983 found that the occurrence of the subject's consciousness was delayed by about 350 milliseconds from the occurrence of the readiness potential, which shows that the consciousness has no causal power to the occurrence of action. Everyone is familiar with this experiment, so I will not repeat it here. But the result of the experiment has become the supreme scepter of heart determinist. The, sub the subsequent J.D. Hans prediction experiments of 10 seconds ago completely eliminated the idea of controlling action by consciousness. It is replaced with unconsciousness that began in the frontal polar cortex and made specific decisions, relevant information in the precunians. So there we can see some down of the freedom from modern science. First, in the series of experiments of Libet, there is an important discovery about conscious veil. Is there really a so-called conscious veil? Yes, in this experiment, it is possible to block or reject the action to be taken within 150 milliseconds after the consciousness appears. Second, although there is no evidence in the current experimental design that no preparation potential occur before the value action, even though there is a space for us to image that. A. If Vedo does not originate from the process of being unconscious to conscious. B. What if Vedo simply means a conscious control, conscious control mechanism? C. What if Vedo requires a neural activity that is very different from regular decision making and action? Is it possible that the Vedo um, manifestation of free will? In Patrick Hager's a naturalized model of human volition, there is a stage called late, late weather decision. In this stage, the calculation model performs predictions and check against the target to correct the action or cancel the action itself. For this kind of decision, the neural activities from anterior frontal median cortex, rostral to pre-sensory motor area is more frequent than making regular decisions. This means mental decision-making has its own unique stimulation and the nerve conduction process. It is undeniable that a person has to be aware of the event before vetoing, which is an awareness. Awareness and the content are different. Even if the content is the same, forming awareness itself requires an additional 400 milliseconds stimulation period. The existence of the content itself does not need the process of being unconscious to conscious. Let's continue. In the article, The Neural Psychology of Conscious Volition by Aaron, it is mentioned that the neural process that we consciously feel that we want to perform an action process and the process that we do perform an action are independent of each other. It misleads us that 
it is the same process or with causation from decision to action. Just because these two processes are highly closed in time. Max Wellman distinguished between the processes responsible for spontaneous action in the brain and our sense of representation of this process. If the latter can faithfully represent the former, we will consciously experience that the behavior is consistent with desire and very possible to execute it. It seems that we need to rethink causality that dialectics of free will depends on, whether agent causation or agent determination. It seems to be blurred under the reflection of the mirror of science. On the other hand, we may see that Aaron and the Wellman's experiments results are like double-edged swords. Pessimistic person will say, oh, it's over. The fragmentary and the incoherent brain function is not even up to me. Optimistic people will find that it leads to a conclusion that consciousness formulation and the brain processes are separated. In other words, consciousness is not produced by the brain at a certain degree. It has its own spatial time dimension. I think Gazaniga must agree with it. This separation makes freedom hopeful. This separation also makes me to think of a radical consciousness theory, which is cosmopsychism. Cosmopsychism is a holistic version of panpsychism. It claims that cosmos is the ultimate fundamental ground mental properties of macro subjects like you and me. But how? Simply speaking, the sense of I-ness is produced by a self-excited local pattern in the energy field in the universe. This sense of I-ness sounds to the cosmic consciousness like the green bubbles that special in the ingredients added to the soup cooked by the witch. The special ingredient sounds like something similar to wish or desire for particularity. According to Roger Penrose and Stuart Hamroff, objective reduction event could be orchestrated enabling functional quantum computing in channels within microtubular proteins. With even more advanced evolutionary development, biological factors could orchestrate and further isolate microtubular quantum computing so that the objective reduction threshold could be reached. A relatively large Gravitational self-energy could be achieved without environmental randomness. They interpreted that such objective reduction moment could provide a rich cognitive subjective experience and control conscious behavior with a non-computable world inference. Now we have some conclusion here. Free will only can be revealed from a close gap only under numerous harsh conditions, which means it's very, very tiny gap to, to the freedom. Second, since it is to be particular, of course, it needs a partition for macro subject like you and me to separate us from others and the desire is hidden as the very source of the momentum for individualization. 
our mind is grounded by the fundamental ultimate, and the body is produced by the will of the mind. The perception is the boundary of the mind. This sounds to open a tiny gap in the closed door to freedom. This is the will of the mind to change destiny that loosen the decisions and the actions that have emerged from unconsciousness for hundreds, for thousands times, and change the way of looking at and responding to the world. Isn't it a great freedom? We don't have free will. But this kind of deeper mental will or mental wish fights for the possibilities to freedom. This is my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Christian Loritz, um, and I am a theoretical philosopher from the University of Helsinki, from Finland. Uh, and my talk is called uh, Phenomenality as a Perspectival Artifact, and it is related to the hard problem of consciousness, and uh, especially to the question whether we need or need not to posit new fundamental laws or entities in order to explain consciousness. Um, there are, in fact, many influential and prominent philosophers and researchers who argue that since the phenomenal aspect of consciousness cannot be reduced to any known physical phenomena, uh, we should simply include it among the fundamental elements of reality. We may call that position the fundamental phenomenality view. Uh, in the present context, the phenomenal aspect should be understood uh, in a conventional way as the felt character of consciousness, the way it feels to see red or experience pain. So, uh, in other words, uh, the notion of phenomenal aspect is supposed to capture uh, what it is like to experience, for instance, redness or pain. And the reason why this uh, phenomenal aspect cannot be arguably explained by the traditional sciences is that um, all the objects of traditional sciences can be ultimately analyzed in terms of structure and dynamics. Uh, but the phenomenal aspect of consciousness has a qualitative character that cannot be arguably analyzed in fully structural terms. Uh, that is at least how David Chalmers formulates the heart problem. And as a response to the heart problem, it has been proposed by many philosophers and researchers that the qualitative or phenomenal aspect of consciousness is a fundamental element of reality, perhaps comparable to fundamental phenomena like mass, charge or spin. Uh, and among the researchers who endorse the above basic idea in one form or another, are David Chalmers, Max Wellmans, Hammerhoff and Penrose, also Tononi and Koch, and other proponents of the integrated information theory, and also most uh, proponents of uh, panpsychism or proto-panpsychism. Uh, and typically, most supporters of the fundamental phenomenality view associate the phenomenal aspect with some empirically accessible phenomena without nevertheless identifying the phenomenal aspect with the empirically accessible features of that associated phenomenon. So, for instance, uh, according to the integrated information theory, uh, phenomenality is a fundamental property of physical systems with specific causal architecture, so that the phenomenal aspect is assumed to accompany certain causal structures without being identical with the empirically or experimentally accessible features of those causal structures. Um, similarly, according to Hammerhoff and Penrose, phenomenality is a sort of intrinsic property or the intrinsic nature of the so-called objective reduction of superposed states or in the case of full-blown uh, human consciousness, the orchestrated objective reduction that is hypothesized to occur in uh, microtubules uh, of some brains, uh, brain cells. And again, what uh, matters in the present context is that, uh, according to Hammerhoff and Penrose, uh, phenomenality is not identical with the empirically accessible features of these objective reduction events but is uh, assumed to accompany these empirically accessible features. And well, the motivation behind these fundamental phenomenality theories is quite understandable. 
especially in light of uh, Chalmers' formulation of the heart problem. Uh, if all objects of science, or at least all empirically accessible features of these objects, are analyzable in structural terms, in terms of causal structures, spatiotemporal structures, informational structures, dispositional structures, and so on, uh, then it seems indeed that um, since the phenomenal properties of consciousness are characterized by their qualitative nature, that seems to be not fully structural, the only way, or at least the most straightforward and obvious way to incorporate those qualitative properties into our scientific worldview is to propose that they are fundamental in a sense of being not reducible to the empirically accessible features of scientific objects. Um, so we may say that acknowledging the hard problem of consciousness uh, pushes us in a way towards the fundamental phenomenality view. But uh, the notion of fundamental phenomenality poses also some very serious philosophical problems. Uh, as noted already by David Chalmers uh, himself, while actually defending the fundamental phenomenality view, was that uh, the view has a paradoxical consequence, because while the view holds that phenomenality is a fundamental aspect of reality that cannot be reduced to the empirically accessible structural features of the world, it also holds that our behavior, so our physical movements of our bodies, can be explained in terms of traditional sciences without any appeal to the fundamental phenomenality. And uh, that would also mean that our behavioral expressions of the beliefs and judgments that we are phenomenally conscious can be analyzed in structural terms and explained by traditional sciences, at least in principle, with no reference to the fundamental phenomenality. Uh, Chalmers has called that consequence the paradox of phenomenal judgment and, um, well, to be sure, it should be noted that we are free to postulate without any threat of contradiction that some particular empirical phenomena are systematically accompanied by phenomenal consciousness or phenomenality. But uh, the problem is that since that phenomenality would be, in an important sense, distinct from all the empirically accessible structural features, it becomes rather mysterious how and in what sense exactly could those structural features express the presence of uh, uh, phenomenal consciousness. Uh, for instance, if the phenomenal aspect is not needed for explaining our behavior, uh, the physical movements of our bodies, then how can the physical movements of our bodies, uh, such as writing or speaking, uh, express the existence of uh, the phenomenal aspect? By analogy, we may postulate without contradiction that whenever an atom loses an electron, the atom feels a rudimentary sadness, and whenever the atom gains an electron, it feels happy. But uh, since uh, such phenomenal properties would leave no marks on the experimentally accessible features of the atom, we may say, uh, slightly metaphorically, that the atom would have no means to express the presence or absence of such phenomenal properties in any experimental settings. And the same is true about more complex systems, such as human beings. Uh, if phenomenality is fundamental in a sense of being irreducible to the empirically accessible factors that control our behavior, then how could our behavior express the presence of phenomenality? So it seems that, uh, the, uh, that the fundamental phenomenality view implies paradoxically that since phenomenality is a fundamental aspect of reality, uh, then we as phenomenally conscious beings should have no means to express the fact that we are phenomenally conscious. And yet, the proponents of the fundamental phenomenality view do not merely want to say that the view is true, they obviously want to say also that the view can be expressed, because they are attempting to express it uh, whenever they uh, defend the view. And, um, well, as we noted earlier, that the hard problem of consciousness uh, seems to push us towards the fundamental phenomenality view. Uh, we may now say that the paradox of phenomenal judgment draws us uh, to the opposite direction, back towards the more traditional reductive explanations of consciousness. 
And it is uh, also worth uh, mentioning that when Chalmers addresses the paradox of phenomenal judgment, he is mainly concerned with the question of how we can know that we are phenomenally conscious if the phenomenal aspect is, in a sense, outside the empirically accessible domain. And his response to this knowledge-related question is that since uh, phenomenality is a fundamental aspect of reality that underlies all empirically accessible structures, we are immediately acquainted with our phenomenality. And thus, our knowledge of phenomenality is based on that uh, immediate acquaintance. Uh, but uh, Chalmers does not uh, address the question of how, we, how it is possible for us to express that knowledge or, or to express the fundamental phenomenality view in general. Uh, for here, it does not help to appeal to immediate acquaintance, because if the expressions of phenomenality belong to the domain of structure and dynamics, then how and even in what sense can those structurally analyzable uh, expressions be about the underlying and empirically inaccessible non-structural nature of reality? So, we are basically facing a dilemma when we try to avoid the hard problem, we are drifting towards the fundamental phenomenality view, but that leads us uh, to the paradox of uh, phenomenal judgment. And when we reject the fundamental phenomenality view in all its forms, uh, then we drift back towards the uh, reductive explanations of consciousness, which leads us again to the hard problem. Uh, but one possible way to defend the reductive the reductive approach against the hard problem is to argue that uh, consciousness is in fact a fully structural phenomenon that merely seems to contain some non-structural elements. Uh, and such, uh, such an approach is sometimes called illusionism and it is uh, perhaps most fam famously defended by Daniel Dennett and uh, more recently also by Keith Frankish, uh, Gustav Markula and some others. And the most typical objection against the illusionist approach is that uh, illusionists deny the existence of the most distinctive characteristic of, uh, characteristic of phenomenal, uh, phenomenal consciousness, uh, namely the qualitative aspect of consciousness. But I would like to propose here a less radical interpretation of illusionism, uh, namely uh, when we say that the non-structural qualitative character of consciousness is an illusion, we do not deny the existence of that qualitative character in an absolute sense. Rather, uh, we say that this qualitative character is a perspectival artifact that has no counterpart in the perspective independent domain. So, uh, there are actually many perspectival artifacts whose manifest content is incompatible with the prevailing scientific worldview. For instance, when we think of um, stage magic where people are apparently cut in half and put back together or objects are teleported against the laws of physics, um, we should acknowledge two things that are very relevant for the present discussion. First, uh, we tend to accept that the scientifically impossible or scientifically extraordinary manifest content of such perspectival artifacts uh, as illusions, does not have to have a scientifically uh, extraordinary counterpart in the underlying perspective independent domain. Uh, and in, in the case of stage magic, we are, not, we are ready to accept that no teleportation or people cut in half occur in the perspective independent domain, even if we don't understand how the illusion is created. And second, uh, we are ready to accept without any philosophical worries that we can genuinely talk and communicate about the manifest content of perspectival phenomena, such as illusions, and that when we do talk about the content of illusions, the causes of our reports and expressions belong to the scientifically ordinary perspective-independent domain, even if the content of our illusions is scientifically extraordinary. So, if phenomenal, uh, if phenomenal properties are perspectival artifacts, then it is no mystery how we can talk about them, even if they are scientifically extraordinary and, and all the causes and reports and expressions belong to the scientifically ordinary perspective independent domain. Uh, now, the skeptic may protest that it is still profoundly puzzling that some perspectival artifacts have a qualitative and non-structural nature. 
And I guess I would have to agree, uh, because in the context of scientific structuralism, it is uh, puzzling that some perspective of phenomena are qualitative and non-structural. And I'm not saying that we have to uh, necessarily go to that direction, but I think it is possible that we have to eventually accept that some perspectival phenomena, namely the non-structural perspective, perspectival phenomena, are from scientific point of view unanalyzable, in a sense that their nature cannot be specified in fully structural terms and thereby cannot be also given a kind of precise structural description that science normally aims at. But there is still huge difference between saying that some perspectival phenomena cannot be described in precise scientific terms and saying that some perspective independent phenomena cannot be explained by the traditional sciences and should be therefore treated as fundamental aspects of reality. Uh, namely, the first claim does not lead to the paradox of phenomenal judgment. And also, uh, it can be argued that there are actually other non-structural perspectival phenomena besides, besides uh, phenomenal properties uh, whose existence we tend to accept without any serious uh, philosophical worries. Uh, even in the context of science, we are routinely accepting that uh, individual scientists or students of science may grasp some complex ideas initially in a vague and unprecise manner. And from the perspective of these individuals, these vague ideas are not just uh, structurally simpler versions of the precise formulations that follow. Uh, for if they were, then the subjects of those vague ideas could always offer effortlessly such uh, simplified structural descriptions. But usually they don't. Usually when we have a vague idea, we are struggling to come up with uh, any kind of clear enough description that could be somehow communicated. And while we struggle, we are not grasping the vague idea in a fully structural manner. Uh, yet we grasp it somehow uh, from our perspective the vague idea is not fully structural, but it is not nothing either. And uh, when we have such vague ideas, we do not usually think that there must be some corresponding vagueness uh, somewhere in the perspective independent domain. We usually assume that the thing that our vague idea is about, as well as the cognitive processes that underlie our struggle to grasp the idea, uh, can be, at least in principle, analyzed in precise and fully structural terms. So, uh, why do we find the existence of phenomenal properties more puzzling than the existence of vague ideas? I think uh, uh, the main reason for that is that um, uh, the, in the context of science, we are not interested in analyzing the perspective-induced vagueness of our ideas, but uh, we are interested uh, to get rid of that vagueness by changing perspectives. So when we have a vague idea, we try to obtain a new perspective that would allow us to grasp that, uh, to grasp that idea in a more precise and, uh, in a sense, structural manner. But in the case of uh, phenomenal properties, um, we are probably biologically locked into the perspectives that maintain the characteristic non-structural nature of those properties. So, uh, what such a perspectival approach to phenomenality suggests is that um, the so-called phenomenal properties correspond to some fully structural perspective-independent phenomena. Perhaps we can analyze uh, them in terms of behavioral dispositions, neurobiologically based non-conscious associations, sensory motor patterns, or some other structural terms. And also that there must be some structure that corresponds to the viewpoint that maintains our non-structural impressions. Uh, perhaps such a viewpoint is spread out uh, to several areas in our brains, as suggested by the global workspace model, uh, or perhaps it can be located to the so-called planning modules in our brains, as suggested by the uh, theory of uh, Christoph Koch. Or maybe the relevant uh, viewpoint is uh, some kind of shared viewpoint of the members of the community of speakers, as Daniel Dennett has uh, recently proposed. But in any case, according to the view, all empirically accessible perspective-independent elements that underlie phenomenal properties can be analyzed in fully structural terms. And the only thing 
that has non-structural features is the emerging perspectival artifact. So, to conclude, the idea of uh, phenomenal properties as non-structural perspectival artifacts raises still some very important and interesting philosophical questions, but even if we would have to accept eventually the existence of such non-structural perspectival artifacts as a sort of brute and inexplicable fact, it would not lead us uh, to any of the serious problems that we encounter when we try to squeeze phenomenal properties into the, into the domain of uh, perspective independent reality. So that was basically it. Um, here is my contact information. If any of you have questions or comments, uh, please feel free to email me. And thank you for your attention. Hello, everyone. My name is Jim Beekler. I'm a physicist. I am a paraphysicist and I do biopsychophysics, although now I've come to call what I do neurocosmology. My two interests are in unification of physics as well as physics of consciousness, which I have combined to make neurocosmology. Uh, basically, I explain everything from with physics, I explain everything from sensations all the way up to the whole universe and back again to sensations. Um, I'm speaking on the title of my presentation is A Comprehensive New Paradigm for Consciousness From Sensations of the External World to Neural Correlates, Whole Brain Coherence, and the Whole Cosmos. Um, the world, the world that you perceive in your brain as our physical reality is not what you think it is. Uh, we've been brainwashed by evolution to see only a three-dimensional world. Um, we only determine our world to be three-dimensional because matter is three-dimensional, and we judge space by the relative positions of matter. But we don't judge three-dimensional space by any quality or characteristic of space alone. So space itself could be any number of dimensions or no dimensions. All we can really say is that the space that our three-dimensional matter occupies must be three-dimensional. And but in reality, space is four-dimensional. And this is a proof that could be proven mathematically. Now, in the motion of matter, we can only use uh, three-dimensional mathematics to explain Linear motion, you can't explain, explain any three dimensional motions or four or, or circular or rotational motions using three dimensional mathematics, um, three dimensional numbers. You must uh, use a four dimensional mathematics to give a completely mathematic description of rotational and circular motions. Um, science seems to have forgotten this that early scientists, early physicists, physicists, in order to use three-dimensional mathematics, had to create fictional pseudo-forces uh, as centripetal force, centrifugal forces, and Coriolis forces that do, not re that do not exist in themselves to explain physics, the reality of the world, and motion three-dimensionally. Now, this is known by William Rowan Hamilton, who in the 1840s, um, developed a four-dimensional number system called quaternions and a corresponding 40 algebra. Now, this algebra, quaternion algebra, was used by James Clerk Maxwell because you don't have to introduce any fictional pseudo-forces into physics. So Maxwell used this to develop his theory of electromagnetism. And this basically showed that electromagnetism has a four-dimensional reality in nature. Now, Quaternion algebra is quite unnatural to us, especially since we're 3D, three-dimensionally brainwashed or biased. So mathematicians in the um, 19th century, later 19th century, then developed vectors, a shortened form of quaternions called vectors, which would allow them to express electromagnetism three-dimensionally. But they lost some of the qualities and quantities of electromagnetism. Do I, 
to do so. Now, why is this important for a physical theory of consciousness? Because we falsely sense our world to be 3D when it is not. Or do we? The truth is that consciousness is both three-dimensional and four-dimensional because mind, which is electrical, and consciousness, which is magnetic, are electromagnetic in nature together. They're coupled together, mind and consciousness. And our five normal senses are the material world of 3D, uh, sense smell, sense of taste, sense of touch, sense of uh, hearing and vision. They're all three-dimensional because they're based on a three-dimensional world. But we also, descend, we also sense a greater four-dimensional space of the world through our higher consciousness, which is our true six, which is our true self in Eastern philosophy, and our sixth sense of paranormal infamy. Um, in a new physics that is now immersion, we are all life, our extremely complex, multi-level complexity product, or a stable self-replicating pattern of three different overlapping and synchronized independent fields: the matter energy field, the electric field, and the magnetic field. Now I've got this broken down. You can see here's 4D space and 3D space. Uh, you have electric field and uh, the magnetic B field, only the B field magnetic field is electromagnetic three space, but the A field magnetic, they're actually three, uh, magnetism is three dimensional, but it's two dimensional and three dimensional space, and then the other dimension of magnetism is the A field in four dimensional space. Then you have gravito gravitism, which is matter energy field, three dimensional space, and that's space time curvature curved in the fourth dimension. But you also have the dark matter field, which is 3D spherically extended along two dimensional tangential line in or of orbit, and then the, in 3D space, and then the dark energy field, which are points in fourth dimension, points in three dimensional, discrete points in two dimensional space, are four dimensional, and that's where dark energy comes in. Now, life, the overall stable complexity pattern beyond our normal biochemistry based biology is a biofield. So the matter energy field pattern or the me field of, in, of internally sta stable curved space time is what we call the biofield. Mind is a, whole, is a whole body effect. It is not in the brain alone. It is a complexity of complexities of electric field and charged particle variations totally, completely throughout the body or a total stable electric field corresponding to the whole of the living organism body. Consciousness is the overall combined magnetic field pattern that is generated by changes in overall E field mind pattern. But, and this is, and this but is imperative, there are two parts to the overall magnetic field, as I said. The B field, which is two dimensional 3D space, is a normal scale of magnetic field. We also have the A field which is a vector field, and that extends point by point into the fourth dimension. So our normal or mundane consciousness upon which we base our worldliness, materialism, and common logic interpretation is the B field in three space. But we also have a single dimensional portion of the overall magnetic field that corresponds point by point to the B field. It corresponds to the B field, but it's not as B field. That is the A field, the vector potential or A field. And this, this is the patterns in the A field, uh, the complexity patterns in the A field, which are memories and thoughts. Um, they constitute our constitution, our, instant, our intuition, spirituality, our, which is spirituality is our innate knowledge of the connection of the whole, to the wholeness or oneness of the universe, and our worldliness. And this comes from for the four-dimensional part of our consciousness. Uh, and those are just those qualities that we usually associate with our higher consciousness. So our lower mundane consciousness is three-dimensional and our higher consciousness is four-dimensional. Now, mind is a whole body effect as the E field. Okay, so our higher consciousness is the only part of our body that extends into the higher fourth dimension of space, beyond normal space-time curvature, and thus acts like an antenna into the universe. Now, this is our me field. The body is our me field of space-time curvature, and our mind, or our brain, 
is the most complex. It's a very complex magnetic field extended, but our heart is actually greater strength there, so it extends higher into the dimension, third, uh, fourth dimension, from three-dimensional body. And then the gut also has a lot of neurons, so it is also highly magnetic, and it expands into the field with our second brain. Both mind and consciousness are whole body effects, but we logically think that they only exist in our brains because of the vast complexity of neural nets that form coherent thought and streams of thought can only be found in our brains. Technically, the brain is only the functional center of the whole body mind. The heart is, has a stronger magnetic field than the brain, so it extends farther into the higher dimension. Now, there are more neurons in the heart going to the brain, and that in, the heart entrains the brain, gives it a sense of timing. Then there are neurons in the brain that extend to the heart for control. So the heart is the functional center of the whole body consciousness, not the brain. Uh, the mundane magnetic B field acts through a pulmonary circulatory system, but the A field consciousness acts and interacts through the whole body through the independent points in space. And these act through the heart and the pulmonary and circuit and through the actual points of space rather than directly through the pulmonary and circulatory system. Our gut, the digestive system, which science thinks is now says is our second brain, also has its own strong magnetic fields, neural system. So it's the functional center of the me field or the biofield. Now this makes sense because the gut is where we change matter to energy. Uh, the matter energy field. So that actually makes sense. Uh, given the structure of life, we can explain how our advanced minds and higher levels of consciousness evolved over time. But this involves a more complete understanding of how our sensations of the outer world are stored and built upon over time. Um, they build ever expanding groups of memory complexities, and complexities and complexities are thoughts and our memories. And that is what constitutes our consciousness. Now, rather fortunately and unfortunately, depending on how you look at the problem, you need as accurate as possible physics of the external world then to understand how we interact with the world to truly understand our true self and how our sensations lead to memories and the development of higher levels of consciousness. But we also, quite paradoxically, need as accurate as possible an understanding of our true self, our higher self, as separate from the external world before we can develop a truly accurate physics of the whole world. This is a paradox. Uh, we, all, we are only now entering the phase of our scientific and knowledgeable understanding of our true reality that we can actually develop a real theory of consciousness, model of consciousness. As the first approximation of burn, brain function, all of our common shared knowledge of the external world comes to our brain and mind via nerve sensors. The nerve sensors create, like our fingertips, create pulses, electromagnetic pulses that move along the axons of our, of our nerves all the way up to our brain. Now, in common modern science, uh, to consider only electrical changes uh, with the body, so they mistakenly think that consciousness is electrical. Mind is electrical. Consciousness is magnetic because as the pulses move up to the brain, any electrical change, whether a field change or change of position of an ion, electro, electrical ion or electron, generates a corresponding magnetic field. So the magnetic field corresponds and is of a higher order. And so magnetism is consciousness and mind is electrical in nature, as many people already think. Um, they only think we only think of magnetism acting in the body normally in science, and we use magnetism then to, as diagnostic tools like the MRI, the fMRI, CAT scans, and such. All you are based on magnetism. <laughs> really, magnetism is, a, is of a higher order than electricity, so it must be our higher consciousness and our consciousness. Um, the electrical field in axons changes as the electrical action potential travels along the axons to and from the brain. And as it does so, it causes, as the electric field in the axon changes, because the microtubule cylinders, the skeletal structure of the axons, 
and all cells to fire in a spiraling manner, and this turns the microtubules into nano-sized biomagnetic induction coils. Uh, and these are classical electric magnetic wave transceivers. Now you can see here the action potential goes up the axon, ions change through the wall that causes the electrical field to change, and then that charges the microtubules as magnetic fields, and they give off a soliton, a pulse. And those pulses, here, 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 then interfere with each other, cause interference patterns between the microtubules. And then they continue on to interact and resonate with similar microtubules in other axons. Now, the, the, each microtubule thus emits a magnetic pulse, not a full electromagnetic wave, but a magnetic pulse, or soliton, I'm sorry, the soliton, not solution, by a photon. And this interferes, and the interference pattern is then picked up by the water molecules, and it quantum polarizes water molecules. And that quantum polarization of the water molecules in the axon is then stored as the pattern. And that pattern represents a matter, uh, it represents a memory, and it is stored five dimensionally in the actual points of the space time continuum. And now that, that allows me to explain how memories arise how recall and recognition are performed in the axons, in the white matter in the central part of the brain. Um, all memories then are complexities and complexities of complexities of A field patterns stored point by point in the 4D single field or space-time continuum. Now this actually occurs at cellular level, a much more lower level. So you actually have cellular memory and your whole body has a memory. At the cellular basis, but only in the mind do we, um, only in the mind, since the mind is functional center of, since the brain is functional center of the mind, only in the mind, in the brain, do we have recognition of consciousness. But actually, consciousness works throughout the whole body through the pulmonary system for the mundane consciousness and through the points of space for the rest of consciousness. And this actually explains how we, uh, we can uh, develop chi in our body. Now, when the complexity systems, these A-field patterns become complex enough during evolution, the living, any living being becomes sentient, aware of itself and its relationship to university and aware of awareness, which is aware of awareness is consciousness. However, even that is only part of the story. The action potential then continues after, after, after the solitons are given off. It continues up the axon to the neural head and into the dendrit dendrites, and then to the bulbs, dendritic bulbs, to other, to others. So you've got this dual action of memories being stored by individual axons in the white matter, but then the information, same information, then travels up to the gray outer matter of the um, of the brain. Uh, so the the outer matter gets the same information. That's and the outer the outer the outer um, gray matter of the brain, which is uh, which is dom dominated by the, 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 the dendritic ends and the bulbs, the dendritic bulbs. Um, that's where um, you have. That's where you have um, the. Um, That's where you have the um, context of everything. And that's the higher thinking comes in the gray areas of the outer brain. Um, these memory patterns are thus reinforced by the plasticity. That's the plasticity, the dendritic ends are the plasticity, which the plasticity of the dendrites are developed by the magnetic fields between axons. When the soliton biophotons go from axon to axon, And here's, here's the, whole, the whole thing. We've got the external world, sensations go up the axons, which are, form the white matter in the brain, and then to the microtubules. And the microtubules, solitons are emitted, causing um, the interference pattern to the water molecules, which is your memory stored, and recall and recognition. Memories are stored in magnetic vector potential patterns in the A field, which is four-dimensional, within our three-dimensional space and extended from our three-dimensional space, four-dimensional. 
but also the microtubules, the silicons emitted, resonate with exterior neural microtubules, and which carries the same information up to gray matter. And then you have the synapses form neural nets, neural bundles and functional structures in the outer brain into gray matter. And then that leads to whole brain coherence. The same, well, since the same information, well, how do we get whole brain coherence? Uh, that's what's important. That's when you actually think of things in your whole brain. And that's important in the whole process. Now the data goes to the gray area, which sets the context. But at the same time, all the solitons, there's so many solitons bouncing around in your brain being emitted by the uh, microtubules. Remember, they're pulses, not full waves. They reach a quantum maximum limit, a density limit, quantum density limit. Then the solitons actually then form full electromagnetic waves. And as full electromagnetic waves then are bouncing back and forth between the white matter and the gray matter of the brain. And that's when it reaches that quantum limit to become full-fledged electromagnetic waves, that's when you have whole brain coherence. And that's the coherence between the white matter solitons and the gray matter coming from the memories in the white matter to the context and different parts of the brain, different functions of the brain, hearing, smelling, and everything in the outer gray area, and the decision-making part out in the cerebral cortex. Uh, that's the gray matter. And so our overall worldview or perception of the world reality that we sense external to ourselves forms in that cerebral cortex area from the independent individual complexity patterns restored in the A field corresponding to the white matter in the brain. So this is part of the brain. The gray matter is where the part of the brain where different signals, memories come from the gray area are categorized and classified within our material, mental context of reality. Uh, then to be built into our overall mental pictures of ourselves in relation to the external world as well as external world. And the gray matter is that part of the brain which directs our survival and decision making to keep ourselves functioning at maximal capacity within our external material world. Um, let me see, I already said that. Um, the, the important thing though is whole brain coherence or cognition, and that comes from the solitons reaching the, the, the level, the quantum level, so they become whole waves and interact the inner brain, uh, white matter is inter interacting with the outer brain. And that's what gives us our waking thought or streams of thoughts, they emerge from that complexity. Now here we have the soft as single field theory, which I'm which I'm actually developing. It's a single uh, field function. Uh, it is not a an energy field. It is a, a, a it is a um, field of potential that becomes energy when it interacts with matter in three dimensional space. So we have the same graph as before. You have three D E field, which is biofield. Two D B field which is mundane consciousness, and you have the A field, which is four-dimensional, uh, your higher dimension. Then you have the me field, matter energy field, which is three-dimensional, and that is, again, uh, the biofield. I'm sorry, 3D E field is mind. 2D B field is Monday consciousness. The A field is, a 4D A field is higher consciousness, or the higher self. Um, 3D field, 3D B field is the whole body. You also have a D field, which is a dark matter field in your body. And this can actually allow your higher consciousness to interact point by point throughout the body to generate chi or ki energy, which is the dark energy field. So chi, ki, or the subtle energy everyone talks about is actually dark energy coming out of the points generated by your higher consciousness point by point throughout the body as a whole. Now this is how our thought processes in the brain fundamentally work. These thoughts and streams of thought, magnetic and electromagnetic in origin, are then stored in the whole brain A field complexity and the whole body A field because they're also interacting with all the points in space throughout the whole body. So it's a whole body pattern, and that's um, equivalent to the whole body complexity pattern, whole brain field, and the whole body field, A field complexity pattern, equivalent to the fourth D single field. Now, this is a source of our intuition, 
spirituality, and many other related but ambiguous mental traits, uh, many regarded as paranormal, by which we characterize our intelligence, wisdom, and imagination. In other words, the higher functions of our consciousness. And we often picture ourselves, say if we have near-death experiences, we picture ourselves as floating above the body. But we're not really above the body. We just picture ourselves because we're above the body four-dimensionally during a near-death experience. But we picture that and when we were revived after near-death experience, we picture ourselves three-dimensionally. We can't, we can't see, we can't picture ourselves four-dimensionally. So we picture ourselves three-dimensionally floating above the body where the high consciousness is. But that's three-dimensional interpretation of four-dimensional space. And this, this, di this graphic picture actually um, summarizes a lot of what I just said. Now, the fourth D single field pattern is the whole forms of our higher consciousness, or rather our true self, or in Eastern religions, something like our Buddha nature, within the context of the universe as a whole, in its wholeness and continuous oneness, just as many Eastern philosophers have envisioned over the past thousand years. So this, this model allows Eastern and Western thought to come together into a unity now. This higher consciousness A field pattern is so vast in its complexity to the complexity that it is and represents the part of us that survives the three-dimensional body of death of the body and brain. So this is our afterlife body. The complexity patterns, the complexity upon complexity upon complexity patterns in the A field, our higher self, our higher consciousness, that is what survives death. And then we then go into death <clears throat> We then go into death, and if we know about how this functions, we actually have self-realization, awareness in death. And in other words, we have we must have a higher level of consciousness while living to understand death. Uh, so, a person's awareness of his or herself within this new physical environment after death, and or his or her awareness acceptance of this new existence as a continuous portion of the single field universe. Uh, the awareness of the continuity and connectivity that characterizes four-dimensional world and universe depends on other factors during life, literally how high a level of consciousness we reach during life. And, uh, what, and uh, including but not limited to the manner of the person's death and the person's understanding and level of consciousness attained while living. So people with near-death near death experiences have some experience in this higher dimension. So they're not, they no longer fear death because they know what's going to happen from the near-death experience. In the near-death experience, a person experiences their higher consciousness just as a, someone who's Buddhist or mystically enlightened experiences that higher consciousness and they form a spiritual enlightenment. A PDF copy of this PowerPoint presentation is available for viewing and downloading at my uh, account online at academia.edu, as well as other related publications. Hello, I'm Dr. Scott Jordan, cognitive psychologist philosopher from Illinois State University. Thanks for watching my video. So what I'm gonna talk about is wild systems theory as a 21st century coherence ontology for the science of consciousness. There are some things I have to admit up front. I love science. However, I also love the taste of ice cream. That's a problem because science currently makes assumptions about what people are that prevent the taste of ice cream from being necessarily real. Now, this of course makes me very sad, but given that my sadness is just as unreal as the taste of ice cream, who cares anyway? My point is, are there different ways to talk about truth, reality, and the taste of ice cream? So I'm going to do this by starting off with a story. The story is called A Boy, A Bracelet, and the Snake. And basically, a boy is riding his bike down the street. He sees a bracelet, turns around, pulls over, bends over, picks up the bracelet, and it turns into a snake. What I do then is I ask my students after I tell them the story to describe it using the concept real. So the first answers usually go like this. Well, the boy thought it was a bracelet, but it was really a snake. Or the boy misperceived the snake as a bracelet. And then I say, well, is there anything real about the bracelet? After a bit of prodding, I usually get an answer something like, 
But the boy really had a bracelet experience, just like people really have dreams. But when I push them on it, it always comes to be the case that the snake is more real than the bracelet. I propose this contradictory use of the concept real is still at work in cognitive science, and in our case, the science of consciousness. Often we talk about trees in the forest and whether or not they make sounds. The idea here is that there are trees outside of us and there are representational trees within us. We see those trees outside of us by the trees in us. Those trees outside of us are experienced as being more real than the tree that's inside of us. Therefore, we call them big R versus little r. We then call them really real trees or sort of real trees. And then when we get sophisticated, we start calling them objective trees versus subjective trees. And then when we get super sophisticated, observer independent trees versus observer dependent trees. Now, the point I want to make here is that reality is being defined in terms of how it's different from experience. Now, this distinction between experience and reality is much older than René Descartes, but we'll just start with him for convenience sake this evening. Descartes starts off trying to figure out the only thing he can't doubt, and the only thing he can't doubt is that he can doubt. Therefore, cognito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. And in Descartes' ontology, the physical world is real, the spiritual world is real, and truth, then, is the degree to which these two realities correspond. And of course, Descartes knows that the physical is real because God made it that way. Now, John Locke comes along later and says, wait a minute, one doesn't need to conceptualize the subjective as being spiritual. One can also conceptualize that as being part of nature, just like my body. This then allows us to have a science of man, i.e. psychology. Truth, however, is still seen as the degree of correspondence between the objective and the subjective. Of course, then everyone knows David Hume came along shortly thereafter and said, wait a minute, won't you be radically skeptical about the existence of an objective realm that lies behind and causes the subjective? For if all we know are the internal impressions external reality causes within us, all we really have access to are those internal impressions. Thus, it's logically incoherent to claim that I can know what's outside of me by what it causes inside of me. Unless, of course, your name is Nero, and Morpheus offers you a drug-induced means of overcoming radical skepticism. So how do correspondence theorists address radical skepticism? Well, what guys like Descartes did was they nested the correspondence relation between the subjective and the objective within a larger scale assumed reality that guaranteed the veridicality of the correspondence relation. In Descartes' case, he believed that although he could doubt physical reality, he couldn't believe that God would actually create a physical reality that didn't match up to his spiritual knowing self. Bishop Barclay took a slightly different approach and argued that we know reality corresponds to our experiences because we all live in God's mind. John Knox says, hey man, I just want a science of man. Darwin comes along later, the origin of species, and changes our description of the subjective. The human part of this, or our subjectivity, is an evolved form of physical stuff. This supports the rise of realism and physicalism. Realism is the idea that you define reality in terms of that which is independent of observers, and physicalism is the idea that everything that exists is physical. Later on, then, you have guys like Hemholtz putting forward the anti-vitalist pact, the idea that no other forces than the common physical and chemical ones are active within organisms. People, therefore, are physical, chemical, biological systems. And the reality of the subjective has to be spelled out in physical, chemical, biological terms. Truth in this framework is still the degree of correspondence between the external physical world and the internal physical world. So the question then is, how do contemporary correspondence theorists attempt to overcome radical skepticism? And I'm going to argue that they do the same thing Descartes did. 
They nest the correspondence relation within an assumed larger scale reality that guarantees the veridicality of the correspondence relation. And that assumed larger scale reality is the evolved physical world. So I know it sounds somewhat anti-scientific to claim that the evolved physical world is an assumption. Here's what I mean. Calling the evolved physical world an assumption does not mean that reality does not exist or that it's purely subjective. When I claim that the evolved physical world is an assumption, what I'm saying is that referring to reality as being physical is neither scientifically nor philosophically necessary. Rather, referring to reality as being physical is a centuries-old byproduct of our attempt to describe what we are in observable, testable, non-spiritual ways. And as a result, when we make the physicalist claim that reality is physical and further assert the realist claim that it is reality because it is mind or observer independent, we do the following. We reify the correspondence-driven, logically incoherent epistemic gap between reality and observers. We also compel scientists then to feel they have to bridge this assumed epistemic gap by a principle such as representation construction, i.e. indirect realism, or affordance detection, i.e. direct realism. An alternative framework to correspondence is known as the coherence model. And in the coherence model, reality is an internally related unity. What this means is that all things are about and constituted of all things. All objects are constitutive of their subjects and vice versa. The notion that reality is an internally related unity is known as the doctrine of internal relations. That is, the relations between entity A and B are actually constitutive of what A and B are. Idealist philosophers such as Hegel proposed views consistent with internal relations in order to avoid radical skepticism. They did so instead of defining reality dialectically in relation to experience in terms of how reality is different from experience, as is the case in the correspondence view. As a result, science was not tasked with providing a context-independent description of the intrinsic objective properties of reality because there are no properties that are intrinsic, that is, independent of all context and therefore independent of the rest of reality. Being universal does not mean being context independent. Just because gravity is universal does not mean it is context independent. But who really believes in intrinsic properties anyway? Who believes that reality reduces to context independent things that are as they are independently of all reality? Jarmer in 2002, for example, argued that particles obtain their inertial mass by moving through the Higgs field. And what is the Higgs field? It is a field that permeates all of reality. What this means is that mass is a relational property, not a property of a particle intrinsically to itself. Bauer, 2011, argues that grounding mass in the Higgs field is equivalent to external grounding. What this means is grounding the property of mass externally to the particle, i.e. relationally. Hari, 1986, argued for ultra-grounding, which is the idea that properties exist as being grounded in reality as a whole. Schaefer, 2003, and Delman, 1989, argued there may be no fundamental level to reality altogether, and Prior et al., in 1982, argued the global groundedness thesis, which basically argues that all properties are grounded in reality as a whole. Rosen developed the notion of relational versus intrinsic biology the idea that biological systems are actually close to efficient cause, which means that in order to have a science of living systems, one cannot pay attention to simply one level of order because the causality one finds at that level of order necessitates an explanation of the higher levels of order that that phenomenon is nested within. So what would a coherence framework look like that doesn't describe what we are in terms of relational versus intrinsic properties, physical versus mental properties, or objective versus subjective properties. People who call themselves coherence philosophers or coherence theorists argue that coherence means lack of contradiction. Most coherentists are referring to the coherence of descriptions. What justifies the formation of any new belief is that the doxastic move in question improves the subject's explanatory position overall and or increases the explanatory coherence of the subject's global set 
of beliefs. That's like in 2012. But being a coherence theorist about theories allows one to simultaneously be a correspondence theorist about truth and reality. For example, I can believe that I know about external trees because of the internal impressions they cause within me. That would be my correspondence theory of reality. And I could say that my experiences are true to the extent that they correspond to external reality. That would be my correspondence theory approach to truth. And then I could also be a coherence theorist about generating a set of statements that describes that coherence framework. My point is being a coherence theorist about models doesn't solve the snake bracelet question. It doesn't overcome radical skepticism. So what does it mean to be a coherence theorist about truth and reality? So I'm going to start to introduce wild systems theory. Wild systems theory conceptualizes reality as a self-organizing energy transformation hierarchy. It's self-organizing in the sense that what we find in that energy transformation hierarchy comes from within that hierarchy. There isn't something outside of reality that comes in and makes things what they are. Hierarchy means that higher level energy transformation systems, such as herbivores, for example, consume lower quality energy transformation systems, such as plants. What I want to point out here is now we're talking about living systems in reality as an energy transformation context, energy transformation system. We're not talking about physical, mental systems, and actually that's the entire point. So the person who made probably the clearest statement on what a self-sustaining energy transformation system might be like, is Stuart Kaufman and his notion of autocatalysis, the notion that in the prebiotic soup, the ratio of diverse chemical types to possible reactions reached a threshold in which certain chemical reactions now started producing their own catalysts. What this means then is that living systems become self-metabolizing systems. The interaction between A and B produces a product that actually feeds back into the AB reaction as a catalyst. The way I like to describe this is that the work produces products that sustain the work what I call self-sustaining work. Now, within this energy transformation hierarchy, emergent systems give rise to new contexts that are for the emergence of new systems. So for example, once there's a plethora of plants that gives rise to the possibility of herbivores, which in turn gives rise to the possibility of carnivores, which in turn gives rise to the possibility of homo sapiens, followed by credit card companies. The point here is that the fuel source dictates the consumer. What's going on here is that evolution is packing more and more structure, more and more constraints into what self-sustaining systems are. Reality then is increasingly being described in terms of context, not in terms of physical versus mental. The new systems that emerge in this hierarchy are themselves autocatalytic, and different researchers have tapped into this idea at different points in history. So, for example, Donald Hebb taught us that neurons that fire together wire together, what he called the cell assembly. What we know now is that when neurons generate action potentials, it gives rise to transcription processes in the nucleus of the neuron, which then gives rise to synapse formation. So, in a sense, the work of being a neuron, of generating action potentials, gives rise, sustains the neuron being a neuron by having more synapses be generated and therefore get caught up in more reactions with other neurons. Of course, Jerry Edelman took this notion and applied it to the brain as a whole with his notion of neuronal Darwinism. Those neural networks that we keep are the ones that we use. B.F. Skinner actually tapped into the idea of self-sustaining work with his theory of positive reinforcement. The idea is that consequences of behavior that actually work to keep that behavior within the organism's repertoire are positively reinforcing. So when this gentleman climbs his tree, picks the apple, eats the apple, the chemicals released by the eating of the apple sustain all the systems that gave rise to this individual's ability to actually grab the apple in the first place. And then Mark Bickard in 2001 made the case that all of these nested levels of self-sustaining autocatalytic work are recursively autocatalytic, i.e. mutually sustaining. Now, the point I want to make here is how we can get the notion of subjectivity and consciousness built into this idea of self-sustaining work. And the idea is that self-sustaining systems are embodiments of the contexts from which they emerged. 
They can be modeled, therefore, as internally related embodied context. My bones, my lungs, my heart are all about the constraints that need to be addressed to propel a mass through a gravity field. What this means is these systems are naturally and necessarily about the context that they embody. There therefore is no epistemic divide. There's no epistemic gap between an organism and its environment. The internal processes are naturally and necessarily meaningful because they are about the embodied context. They are about the context they embody. Self-sustaining embodied context avoids both the notion of epistemic gaps and contextual gaps. All phenomena reside within context, therefore are naturally and necessarily about context. Meaning, phenomenology, consciousness, value, these are all the natural necessary aboutness of which embodied contexts are constituted. Truth in this kind of system is determined by coherence, by the lack of contradiction in our moment-to-moment -moment world of aboutness, i.e. our moment-to-moment -moment world of experience. Because it can't be correspondence, because it's logically incoherent, there can be no final external reality to which experience corresponds. What there can be is modulation of my aboutness, while I simultaneously modulate the aboutness within which I am nested. Complex systems theory deserves a wild ontology that is consistent with the coherence of the idealist philosophers and contemporary philosophers of science. That's cool, Scott. But how does any of this matter? Well, I'll tell you what. You know what? The taste of ice cream is worth fighting for. Now I am happy. And it's necessarily real. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching my talk. If you'd like to send me a question, please do so to jsjorda at ilstu edu. You can also look me up at my university webpage. Here's a link to a talk I gave at the Anticipation and Anticipatory Systems Conference, Humans Meet Artificial Intelligence that you're generating unconscious foot anticipations is when they don't work. You can also find me at the Dark Loops production channel on YouTube, where I post podcasts about live life, science, and all things pop culture. Something for a very long time mm -hmm. and has been, I think it was like 10 or plus years without ever dying. Um, and someone who sort of broke through without mm. it being sort of this revolutionary. You can also find an interview I did on Dr. John Leader's podcast, Mind, Self, Body. It becomes right. more likely that we'll achieve that. Right. So it seems to be that navigation. Yeah, the, I like the idea of navigation. And last but not least, a San Diego Comic-Con at Home presentation, Wakanda Forever, The Psychology of Black Panther. The T'Challa, specifically, but also just many people in Wakanda in general, show in their actions that there's no fundamental conflict between science and spirituality. Again, thanks for coming to my talk.